Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to present today. And my topic related to payment reform is the patient-driven groupings model, which came into effect in Medicare certified home health organizations, January 1st, uh, 2020. And so I wanna talk a little bit about kind of the story of what we did and how we use it as an opportunity to engage in clinical transformation. So before we do that, I wanna tell you a little bit about Bayada. You know, our roots, we started in Philadelphia in 1975, founded by Mark Bayada. It was a private family owned home health provider up until uh, January 1st, 2019, when we actually transitioned to a non-for-profit organization. Uh, our world headquarters are in Morristown, New Jersey, just across the river of Philadelphia, where I live. Uh, we've got offices in about 30 or 40 states uh, in five countries. Uh, and we take care of a lot of people, about 30,000 people a week. Most of those folks, about 23,000 in the home health practice. Um, another thing about BEATA that I think is important is, you know, our work is rooted really in our core values, uh, what we call the BEATA way, compassion, excellence, reliability. And we're the only large national home health company that has 10 in-house service lines. You can see them here. I currently serve as the president of three of these practices, home health, hospice, and physician services. Uh, today's conversation is going to be about the work we did uh, a few years ago related to the implementation of PDGM in our home health practice. So one more thing about home health specifically here at Bayada before we transition because it's foundational and it was provided the vision and the direction as we were trying to do innovation around clinical practice. And that is we have a, a mantra of trying to reduce variation and improve performance in everything we do in the practice. It's for, it's, it is structured around five pillars that we use in the organization to measure our uh, effectiveness and our success. Uh, and those pillars start on the left and go to the right people, right? Our employee satisfaction, service, so client, what we call client satisfaction, maybe patient satisfaction, your nomenclature, quality, obviously, growth, are we growing? And finance, are we leaving enough pennies left over to reinvest in the business? Five pillar performance. And so how do we reduce variation and improve performance across all of those pillars? Uh, and for us, a lot of that is around investing in people. And then, uh, one subset of that that I talk about very specifically in the practice is the Bayada quadruple aim, right? So this is the same as, as the quadruple aim that many of you are familiar with. I've changed the language to be a little bit more Bayada specific. So it's empathy, uh, kindness, thought, thoughtfulness, listening, and caring, which drives client and patient satisfaction, empowerment, confidence, knowledge, and team-based decision-making, which drives employee satisfaction, efficiency, organized, optimized, streamlined, focused on what matters. It's uh, speaks to sort of cost and efficiency. And then effectiveness, are we getting the outcomes we want through coordination, clear communication, shared goals and shared success. And so you'll see that the tenants of this quadruple aim uh, uh, very much impacting and, and built into uh, the strategies we put together to address PDGM. So let's get into it. Um, we're always sort of focused on the future because things are constantly in a state of change and flux and payment reform to uh, Medicare certified home health uh, agencies has been forecasted for, for many years. MedPAC had been calling for change, so we knew it was coming. Um, and in 2019, uh, PDGM, patient, the patient-driven grouping model, was confirmed that, in fact, it was going to go into place starting January 1st of 2020. So that's a big change. You know, so as a review, let's just talk about what this was. It was Medicare's new vision for home health, payment linked to client, better client, uh, better linked to client characteristics and resource use. And there were sort of four key elements. So for us, these were one, a shift to two 30-day payment periods instead of one 60-day. The patient was discharged in less than 30 days. You only got a portion of that payment. Uh, and so it could have significant ramifications. And also it, it made us think more about length of stay, which is important because time is your friend in terms of healing. And, and so we've been working on trying to make sure we're seeing people not uh, long enough, not too much, not too little. And so this really forced us to take a focus on it. Uh, payment based on client characteristics. So these new grouping, groupings, both clinical and functional classification systems, uh, we had to learn and pay more attention to. And then there was this higher payment for pa uh, patients with higher acuity uh, referred uh, from hospitals and SNFs. The payment was higher than if they came from physician practices or the community. And then finally, the big one, which MedPAC had been forecasting and talking about for a long time, is they finally went ahead and removed therapy thresholds uh, from the payment model. Uh, payment was driven previously. Extra therapy payments drove extra therapy visits uh, with certain cutoffs would drive more payment, as many of you are aware. That was a big change. And so for us, three of these four, we really had to focus on. Um, we weren't going to focus on where our, our, our patients came from. We're going to treat them the same no matter what. But if we're going to try to address these three new, we had to really think about earlier and more intense focus on care planning. And then reevaluation of clinical needs and resources. So that's a balance between now nursing and therapy because they're both, uh, they're, they're both sort of equally valuable. 
uh, where that was different before. So to me, what's the right clinical mix to us? What was the right clinical mix to get the outcomes we we're looking for? And then visit utilization across each episode of care, the 60 days and the each, three, each 30 day epi, um, uh, segment. Uh, and, and to me, that was really an opportunity for us to look at and think about dosage, right? What's the right amount of care delivered at the right time by the right uh, uh, combination of clinicians. And so it was daunting, but actually really exciting for us. And at this point, I need to recognize a colleague of mine, uh, Tony Delonzo, a physical therapist. Tony was the, was the architect and the key driver for this. My job was to clear the path, uh, but Tony really helped lead that effort. And, uh, and so the results uh, and, and several of the slides he helped, uh, he helped me create. So what do we do? We had several of us, Tony, myself, and others. We had to understand the, once we understood, uh, uh, well, once we understood the model, we had to look at What's the impact going to be uh, to us based on uh, if we change nothing, kind of what, what, what will things look like? So first, we had to assess our existing practice. So uh, we took sort of a close, a, a clear eyed and very close look at how we were doing now and found some things that were quite surprising and plenty of opportunities for improvement. Um, so first, clinical variation, our length of stay, we actually saw uh, more people for less time than the national average. And the, and the national average, 30% of patients were seen, were discharged within the first 30 days. 70 made it past that first 30 days. For us, it was almost, it was 43%, close to 50% were discharged in the first 30 days. And so if that's a, a difference of clinical mix, that makes sense, but we need to really make sure we understood that. So we were giving people the care that they needed. The other piece that to me was more unsettling, if we go back to reducing variation and improving performance, there was a tremendous amount of variation in the uh, average number of people discharged in the first 30 days across our 80 offices, ranging from 70% in some offices discharged in the first 30 days to some offices where it was only 15%. And so we needed to get our arms around that. But to me, what was most concerning uh, and probably one of the biggest calls for clinical uh, evolution and innovation is what we found is thir a full third of the people that we discharged within the 60 day episode were, were readmitted back to the hospital after we discharged them. And that means we didn't do our job. A full third, 33% were readmitted. And this was after we had discharged them. If we stayed in a little bit longer, we probably could have positively impacted that readmission. And so this was an opportunity for improvement. Then we looked at our visits per episode, right? And our visits didn't seem to always correlate with client needs. And so uh, you can see on the pink, these are visits, uh, less than six visits per episode. And the blue was more than 25 visits. And so the question was, um, you know, six, less than six visits doesn't sound like a lot of care. So was it too little? Hard to tell. Uh, more than 25 visits equi uh, equates to about two to three visits a week for nine weeks. Feels like a lot of care. Um, but again, is it too much? Not sure. But 12% of our episodes accounted for almost a, thir a third of our, of our visits. And so part of what we looked at is, can we reduce this long tail um, of, of visits with, without reducing outcomes and maybe improving them? And can we, can we move the pink a little bit to the left uh, and, and improve the mode? The mode was six visits. Um, and so we, this, we were just setting a, ground, a groundwork for kind of how we're doing now to see if the impact, what, what impact had as we, as we improved. And then finally, visits per episode, the variation, it was 14.8 visits um, per episode, but it varied across offices pretty specifically. Um, and so 14.8, not percent, uh, apologies, but uh, 20 visits per episode on average in some offices, only 11 in others. So we had work to do. And finally, what was at stake if we didn't change? We, we overlaid the new payment model on how we had performed in the previous year. Uh, if we kept doing it the same way, we were, we were gonna look at a 10% revenue change uh, and a significant impact to our bottom line. So there were some real financial implications here, but as you can see, opportunities for clinical improvement and outcomes. And look at the, look at the impact for us in rehab on therapy. About a 20% decrease at the revenue impact, a decreased revenue specifically on episodes that had therapy involvement. So we had to figure out how do we continue to deliver multidisciplinary care and get good functional outcomes um, without necessarily breaking the bank. So once we had the analysis that led to our strategic plan, so the focus was first, we'd redesign the care plan process using huddles, which I'll talk about in a second. And the goal for those huddles was to do three things, make sure the client had a great experience, make sure the employee felt empowered, and make sure that we were getting good quality outcomes. So three of the four aims of the quadruple aim. We wanted to clarify expectations for utilization, visits per episode, and this long tail, so dosage, as I mentioned. Uh, and that was really an efficiency play for costs. And then we just continued to analyze and understand institutional mix and usage of paraprofessionals and others so we could get smart as we went along. And so once we had a strategy 
the design rollout and adoption became the most important challenge. And so we created what was called the patient-driven plan of care process, which is really structured around a huddle and then team-based utilization um, uh, um, of a care plan. We identified recommended number of visits based on the clinical complexity of that patient uh, and gave the team the opportunity to determine what was the best way to utilize those visits. That it was, should it be more nursing? Should it be more therapy? But that, in, that uh, empowerment of the, of the team to make that decision was a really positive aspect of it. And then we really had to help people understand kind of what is PDP, right? So a focus review and initial assessment, some analytics to augment the care plan design around visits, this huddle. For every, for every patient, team discussion, integrated care plan, let the patient know now that we've got a clear plan what, what to expect so their experience is better, deliver on that plan and continuously monitor for changes, reconvene and adjust the plan if necessary and measure our outcomes. Uh, sounds simple, but each of these elements were really important in terms of getting them up and running. And then, and then roll out, right? Develop, collect feedback, enhance and socialize. So we spent a lot of time talking about what the huddles were and how they work, because that was a big change for people. And then worked on getting buy-in by repeating reinforcement for myself and others. And so here's an example of, of, of our wave one. We did three waves of rollout. <clears throat> Took about six weeks to get the training completed and another six weeks till people were really sort of in the groove as we found. And so, uh, so it worked pretty well because what we did at the end of 2019 before PDGM was live is we went back and looked at our results. So remember, we had 14.8 visits with a mode of six in early 2019. By late 2019, the green line, right? This is half a year, so it's half the number of, of, of uh, patients, so 23,000. We dropped the average visits per episode by one and a half visits, but the mode increased to 12. And so fewer folks were getting significant High, significantly high number of visits and more folks, or fewer folks were getting less visits. And so we smoothed out the curve, which our belief was that was gonna help drive better outcomes. And in fact, early on it did, and you'll, as you'll see in a minute, it's continuing to do that. Our hospitalization rate dropped from 17.5% to 16.9%, which doesn't sound like much, but across thousands and thousands of patients, that's a big deal. If we had trended at 16.9 for the entire year of 2019, we would have actually kept 900 more people out of the hospital. And so we felt pretty good that we were on the right track in terms of the, the, the impact of the model. And so uh, to finish up, like that was great. That was January 1st, 2020. We're out of the gate, we're feeling good. But before we even get a quarter under our belt uh, in March of 2020, the pandemic hits. And then it was just figure out how to kind of, as you all know, how do you just keep, keep going? So we had a chance to, to look back and say, like, how have we done through two years of a global pandemic in terms of our PDP uh, huddle process and our outcomes? And the good news is we've actually done incredibly well. We, we sustained the outcomes. Here's our baseline I shared with you before. Um, we've gone to 13.1 average visits, which isn't far from what we were at the end of 2019. We reduced that long tail by 50%. Uh, six percent of episodes more than 25 versus 12 and the mode now sits comfortably at nine visits and so we feel really confident that we're giving people more consistently the right care at the right time at the right dosage how do we know that well it goes back to if you follow this process which i call the virtuous cycle right? improve length of stay right so you can use time mother nature to your to your advantage deliver the right of care and the right dosage you improve your outcomes you get more capacity because you're spreading out the number of visits so people at least initially can see a uh, more absolute number of patients. Uh, and then as we get more efficient and more effective, we can continue to grow. So final uh, data here, how do we do? Well, thinking about clinical first, making sure we operationalize it, and then we use our business development team to grow. We did, uh, uh, we did that incredibly well powered by the huddles. So if you look at our star ratings in 2019 in blue and you look at the distribution in red, you can see the significant shift through the pandemic. We had four more stars at 35%, four more offices at 35, let's say it again. We had 35% of our offices at four more stars in 2019. We're now at almost 100%, just amazing improvement. We had 16% of our offices at four and a half or more stars. We're now at nearly 80%. This is using SHP, the most recent three months worth of data. The CMS data is catching up. This is a good lead indicator. And what we found is we've improved in timely initiation of care and hospitalization, but the big movements were in functional outcome measures, addressing uh, bathing ambulation. So we know that we did it by continuing to utilize therapy effectively. 
And then we were able to take care of more people. You can see we had a census of about 16,000 right before the pandemic. You can see here where, the, where we had the drop in, in our census. And then because we just finished a quarter, I just added this to the, to the table, we actually finished this quarter with 23,000. So we're caring for 6,600 more people every day than we were pre-pandemic, 40% uh, growth uh, over time. So we're really excited about what we've been able to do. What I would say is the right structure, the right process, and engaging people around the quadruple aim actually works. Uh, and it's been amazing. It's been an amazing journey, and I appreciate the opportunity to share it with you. Thanks so much.